Note, this video is not a defense. It's not its purpose. The purpose is trying to explain a certain mindset and maybe plain ways to combat it. Recently, popular pro gamer get YouTubers, Bargain of Akkad came under several attacks from different voices. Be it a debate with a feminist who critiqued his relationships and actions regarding the Sarkeesian Effect documentary, Gamergate voices questioning the ethics of his actions regarding a game he's developing, or an anti-feminist feminist, probably one of his subscribers, again attacking him on the basis of association with one Davis Arini. I like looking for patterns and prime reasons. I want to know what moves things and what causes them to be the way that they are. It could manifest in engineering, as all sciences, merely the recognition and prediction of patterns and their mathematical expression, and it could manifest in human behavior. The underlying pattern in all these attacks has to do with the worldview of his critics. There is something about the way they perceive reality and the nature of people that brought them to make these attacks. I'll preface this by saying, this is my interpretation, called by my worldview and cynicism. The observation in this case is only as good as the observer. Still, this is what I saw. All these attacks attributed responsibility to Sargon, which he didn't think should be attributed to him, and by the reception of his viewership, it seems the sentiment was echoed there. There was the underlying assumption that his audience in particular, and Gamergate in general, are stupid, easily influenced, and lacking a will of their own. Sargon's actions and associations were deemed problematic because of how they might be construed by his audience, how they might be influenced. Talking with Arini is suddenly seen as endorsing him and his views. Irregularities and hitches in game development, which happens because life sucks, are seen as violations of personal ethics and ideals previously set forth. Now cut off my dick and call me Caitlin, but that sounds very much like something an SJW might say. And we shouldn't be surprised, since it stems from a certain view of people and human actions. The way I understand it, and again, this is only the way I understand it, SJWs don't see people as individuals, I don't care if they say that they do, their actions speak louder than their words. Instead of seeing people as individuals, they see them as groups. Men, women, white, ethnic minorities, straights, gay, for them, people have no existence outside all the groups and categories they can be crammed into. Since they see them as inseparable parts of a group, they assume that on some level, they are the same. They feel the same, react the same, want the same things, and get offended by the same things. They are derived from the definition of the group. This sort of thinking is very easy to recognize. I'm offended by X, therefore X must be offensive to all the people I identify with. Be it a game offensive to a woman, ethical violations offensive to a gamer gator, or an association a feminist finds distasteful. The second part is the scary and dangerous belief that humans are programmable. Again, this may not be what they are explicitly saying, but it is undeniably implicit. Saying that certain representations of women in media can affect how men perceive and treat real women, that adding characters of people of color to games will make them feel more accepted, that recommending a channel implies endorsing it, and that some people should not be talked to because it gives them a platform and people might find them legitimate, all implies that people are not free agents, not free thinkers, not free actors, but can be programmed by outside factors and forces. These views, besides being dehumanizing, are collectivist. Collectivism sees the individual as inseparable from an arbitrary collective, as determined by an arbitrary authority. Women are not a collective, and neither are Sargon's viewers. Like everyone, they're a collection of individuals, acting individually. They might have some tendencies in common, some common characteristics, but they also have things that make them very much different from one another. Just as an example, I've been a subscriber to Sargon's channel, I think, since before Gamergate, and have remained one. And being a right-wing nut does not prevent me from subscribing to a moderate left YouTuber. I can disagree with them on the subject, and it's okay. I might get views challenged, I might consider things I haven't before, even if I end up still in my views. Humans are not programmable collectives, which just act as they are pushed and prodded. I'll go a bit far and say, this is what the charming place known as Communist Russia was based on. And I'll try to tie it together and show how it all connects. I want you to take a look at this picture. You can find the full picture online. It depicts the two great philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, master and student, arguing. On the left is Plato, who is pointing upwards. Plato is an idealist. He thinks that behind every physical manifestation we see, there is perfect form. 
an ideal. The only thing that's real is an idea, the form. He concerns, concerns himself with what's ought to be, since he's an idealist. In his book on the ideal state, Plato describes an utopist vision. In Plato's ideal state, there is no private property. To help avoid confusion, since children could be seen as belonging to their parents, the institution of the family is also abolished. Then he does away with gender roles, because you can say that's my job, that's another person's job, that's a man's job, jobs don't belong to men, roles don't belong to women, and that would be the ideal state. A country full of drones that act in harmony, and they transcend human selfishness and create a cohesive society without arguments. Sounds like a communist wet dream? Sounds like a page of the manual for the novice social justice warrior? Shouldn't be surprised, folks. You shouldn't be surprised. On the right is Aristotle, who raises a restraining hand and holds it over the ground. Aristotle is a realist. He claims that what's real is reality. What is? According to him, there is no world behind the physical world which we inhabit. He does not concern himself with what is ought to be, but with navigating and adjusting to reality and life. According to him, there is no ideal state, only a system which helps different people live together and not kill each other, in spite of their differences. It can even help harness human selfishness and help it not turn on others in society. He strives for balance. Some people claim that the entirety of human history has been a struggle between the Aristotelian and the Platonic. I don't know if I'm fully involved with that interpretation, but I can certainly see how it's expressed in the recent history and how to apply it to recent conflicts. The American Revolution was Aristotelian. The French Revolution was Platonic. The Communist Revolution, the Social Justice, they're all Platonic. Now, I think that Gamergate is Aristotelian. But I'm on fag, you'll say. Gamergate is about ethics. Isn't that an ideal? Of course it is, Billy. But it's not an ideal. Why would Gamergate want ethical press? What does an ethical press do? They report the truth. They report reality. In the Aristotelian view, there is no narrative. There is no capital T truth. There is one truth, which is reality. And that is what, what Gamergate demands of the press, who sold their soul for the greater truth, trademark of social justice. They believe in a narrative, in a greater truth. In these terms, I think Sargon has bungled his defense by repeatedly granting his opponents their premises instead of challenging it. The only proper response to you have a responsibility to your viewers besides no I fucking don't, which he did use, is why the hell would you think that? Why do you say that? You have to challenge the assumption, which is a technique you should have learned from Andrew Breitbart. If you're curious to see how these things look like in real life, a recent Facebook post about an AMA in Kotaku connection that wasn't really supposed to be public has recently surfaced and has been archived, and going into it could reveal some very interesting details. Look at these comments. They're basically implying that people are around because they're given attention not because they have a particular grievance. It also attributes magical power to the media as being able to set not only the tone, but what people think. This is why so many people in this thread advise not to engage, as you can see. And as James Rodriguez says, I'm with David and Patrick. The only reason these fuckwits are still around is because they're getting attention. One Christian Reed makes an interesting point here. I can't imagine it will be a reifying experience, but the conversation is happening and won't die out if you deprive it oxygen. That's not how these things works. You're right, Christian. Every conversation should be engaged with. Every conversation should invite more people to partake part of it. And you should be very concerned that some people are trying to quote-unquote deprive people, deprive conversations of oxygen. Why don't they want the conversation to happen? I would also quote Alison Tiemann and say, that people on the right side of history don't have to shut up the people who oppose them. Anyway, I think it was Alison. I really don't remember for certain. But the guy goes on. But visible industry figures presenting counter-narratives to the little weasels might be useful, and if nothing else, you get a few thousand words out of it. Put on your kicking pants and do it. Now, <laughs> the conversation is happening, but it's happening without the journalists. What gets me goat about visible industry figures he mentions, and it comes up later in the comments, is the examples they provide. They're 
view of reality is completely skewed. For them, prominent industry figures are many literally who's, such as Anita Sarkeesian, which is not even an industry figure, or Zoe Quinn, which isn't very prominent, or Brianna Wu. Those people, they get visible and prominent not through merit, but through PR. The work can have merit. Maybe it's just not to my taste, but I personally don't think that it does. Also, I want you to notice the vocabulary they use, the semantic fields that they use. It's very interesting, it's all very wrapped up in violent imagery. Perhaps they have been playing too many violent video games. David thinks his opponents are creating their own narrative because he believes everything is a narrative. What he isn't even considering is A. Maybe he is wrong and B. Maybe there is no narrative. It couldn't possibly be that it's not about a narrative. The rest of the point he makes though is valid, so I'm willing to give credit where credit is due. This is the point where one commenter gets really, really confused and he doesn't know what to think. He says, I've heard loads of different things though. I've heard women tell me that every time we talk to them about them, women suffer. That makes me want to do the oxygen death thing. That really hit me actually to the point where I didn't want to address it at all. But I've also been told that men can't keep quiet. So I've tried the talking thing as well. I'm at the point where I just don't really know how to approach it. I just don't engage. They're desperate for legitimacy. I just try and deny them that. But it's such a massive gray area. The truth is, they're like fucking cockroaches. I feel like their impact has been reduced and they've lost all legitimacy, but that's just my own perspective. I'm sorry, Mark, but it seems that if someone here is confused, if someone here is desperate for legitimacy, it's, it's not the side that you're opposing. We see here the epitome of collectivist thinking. Every time you talk about them, women suffer. Women are part of the hive mind, they're the Borg. Not several women, but women. The mystical archetype of women. Everything we do must be measured according to a woman's suffering. Is that it? You, you think that the entire world works like that? I really, really pity the fool who lives in a world which he thinks works like that. It must be so disheartening. Now here Christian makes some gold and points and I think they're worth uh, losing some time over. In the real world of proper politics, if you don't engage with bad ideas, you lose. What would you want to see? A group of racists marching through the streets demanding all Muslims get chucked onto the moon? Or a coalition of hundreds of different kinds of people marching against them saying, no silly r racist drongo, silence isn't a useful tool in a discussion. You're right Christian. That is why people like Gamergate and threads like Kotaku in action hadn't stayed silent. They saw what they considered were bad ideas. They engaged. And your response to people engaging with what they perceive as bad ideas is trying to shut them up. The only thing that beats bad ideas are good ones. It's not about crushing or even punching some little tit midget in his goddamn trachea no matter how much they deserve it. Again, again with the violence. The, these people, and I'll go into it a bit later, but these people are incredibly violent. They're just too afraid to express it. It's about creating better ideas and about creating narratives in which you encourage, not convince people, to change their minds and join the armies of light. It's about having better ideas and using them. Now we also see the messianic terminology that these people are very fond of. Armies of light. God damn it, man. In which planet are you living in? It's... It's... And also about creating the narratives and joining... Recruiting people to an army. That's fucking fascist, man. You're trying to sell people a story. You're literally saying it. You want to sell people a story so they would join your side of an army and use force against other people. You realize how sick it sounds. Study after study shows that people don't change their minds on political issues very much, if at all, by convincing. If you ever felt these people weren't responding to logic, it's cause people don't. Christian people respond to logic, but they also respond to story. The problem is that you're relying on the fact that people only respond to story. I was a lefty back when I was a wee lad, but I learned. I became smarter. 
during college, I had a study partner for the entire duration who was also a lefty. Now he's a righty. We just talked about it. And we talked and we talked and we got to the truth. You say that Spock is a hateful lie, but maybe it's both. He says people do respond to examples, to ideas, to humor and warmth, which is the sugar. Facts are the medicine. And he's kind of right about it, but it's also very pernicious. When you let the opposing side frame you as Darth Vader, it doesn't matter how right you are, you're going to lose in the hearts of mind of the populace. That is true, but when you frame the argument only in terms of feels and not in terms of facts, it allows you to bring in any hateful idea that you want. Also, this is very, very worrying. You're not going to run down the hallway of the Gamergate sacred lair, an explosion rushing behind you, nor sadly will you stand up, light a cigar and crack a pun as the flames dance, haste as that would be. You understand that these people fantasize about being violent towards other people, daily, constantly. This is what they're enmeshed in, and you expect these people, these journalists, to give adequate coverage. You will, however, be a prominent voice arguing against them. You will be an example for people to stand up and of a chap who doesn't buy into the sexist drivel. You will be su a supportive voice to people who might really like to hear supportive voices. And that's great. That's really good. That's really good to be part of a fucking echo chamber, you fucking moron. I... I'm really too lost for words at this utter idiocy. These people have never engaged. They have never, ever engaged. They always block you on Twitter, they never come to debates, and remember that for Gamergate, the enemy is not the literally who's, they are the journalists, and none of the journalists have ever agreed to engage in a public forum. It is not surprising that Christian admits he is from the far left. If that fails, just scream shitlord really loudly. It's just a great way to talk with people. I am very disappointed. How can he start this well and go off the deep end so quickly? I think the archive ends with a reply that does make sense. Mark says, he says and quotes, Here's my idea. It's pretty revolutionary. Instead of fighting for the purity of our chosen games or trying to shut down anyone who has a different opinion that you hold, how about we try and talk? Think the worst you have to lose is your time. Talking may not make things better, but there's always the sliver of chance you may change minds or have your own changed. Dead for tat, man. Dead for tat. I, I have nothing more to add to that. Yeah, maybe you journos need to stop fighting for the purity of the ideology you want to see in your games. You even perceive ideology in games. Maybe you should stop for that. Maybe you should join the conversation and have your mind changed. You see, this is what a society based on rules for radicals looks like. The problem is that idealism is a natural draw for people who are drawn to power. It is a sink for power-hungry people, because it allows them to exercise unlimited power in the name of a higher truth. It doesn't matter if on one hand they're saying that they want to facilitate a conversation and on the other hand they want to deprive other people of oxygen, because these people shouldn't have oxygen because one conversation is right and the other is not. The rest of the idealists, the one who just agree with the ideas that the power of hungry people reiterate by this interpretation are what's telling called useful idiots. The fact that some people enjoy a product which is Sargon's videos does not mean that they own Sargon. He has no inherent commitment to them, nor does he own them, as he's not their father and they're not his children. Calling them young, impressionable people is by far the most disparaging and disgustingly collectivist thing someone could say. Since Sargon is the same person, he actually respects his viewers and assumes they are fully-fledged human beings with thoughts and emotions of their own. The exact opposite of what social justice does. Now I know! And knowing is half the battle. Run for me.